Okay, we'll go ahead and get started here. Hello everyone and welcome to this month's Northwest ATTC webinar. I'm Jennifer Verbeck and I'm your host for today. We're excited to have Dr. Stacy Rasmus presenting for us today on Kungazovic Tools for Life, an Indigenous intervention to prevent alcohol misuse and suicide among Yupik Alaska Native youth. Uh, before we go ahead and get started here, I have a couple of housekeeping things. First, if you have any questions for our presenter, please type them into the chat box at any time. After she's finished speaking, I'll read the questions in the order that they were received. You'll also be getting an email at the end of today's webinar that has a link to a survey in it. Please take that survey. It helps us make sure we're bringing you the content you're interested in. And that email will also have a link to download the survey or the slides from today and a link to our website where you'll be able to find a recording of this webinar. And that should be available later this afternoon. Uh, additionally, we'll be sending everyone who attends this live webinar a certificate of attendance, and that takes us about a week. You don't need to do anything to get the certificate unless you're watching this in a group. In that case, please have someone in the group email us within a business day with the names and email addresses for everyone who wants a certificate. And you'll see our email address up there. It's northwest at attcnetwork.org. Okay, now on to the webinar. As mentioned earlier, today's speaker is Dr. Stacy Rasmus, who is the director of the Center for Alaska Native Health Research at the University of Alaska, and that's in Fairbanks. She also holds a joint research faculty appointment with the Northwest Indian College in Western Washington. Dr. Rasmus has also worked with American Indian and Alaska Native communities for over two decades and has built an international program of research focusing on the promotion of uh, indigenous strengths, resilience, and well being in Alaska, the Arctic, and the Pacific Northwest. And uh, with that, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to Stacy. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I am clicking to take on these slides. I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate everyone who has joined this presentation today and um, given your time to come with me on this decades long journey that we've been undertaking here in Alaska through our Center for Alaska Native Health Research with uh, primarily what I'll be talking about today is work being done in Yupik Alaska Native communities and I'll be providing more introduction to these communities but here are some wonderful photos from just the last few months of young people so these are very current very right now photos of young people living their Yupik uh, ways of life and culture and living through their culture as a way um, of gaining protection and strength and living their ancestral resilience. And I'm really excited to talk with you about these projects. Um, I, as mentioned, I, I was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest in Bellingham, Washington, where I have familial and still have um, professional ties that I'm excited to keep going. My work through the Northwest Indian College focuses um, mainly around, uh, well, again, strength based work around uh, combating um, the crisis and epidemic we have with opioid uh, overdose deaths. And so we're really excited to employ some of the similar strategies though in conducting research to identify what's preventative and strengthening within Coast Salish communities. Um, but really that work has, has come from um, and built on the work I'll be presenting today. And just for those who might not be familiar with, with Alaska and uh, Alaska Native people and cultures, this young lady is inflating, this is whale gut. And it was strung up between all the houses in the village. It's about the length of a football field and it's used for um, sewing, still making waterproof clothing and preserving um, oils and good tasty things to eat. So my presentation today, first I'll do a brief background um, about Alaska and so that we can understand what the prevention landscape here looks like. Um, and you know, I know that this is the Northwest ATTC, so we might have some Alaskans on this call, um, 
but you know, I, I'll, I'll, so I'll be able to go quickly, I think a little more quickly through this, but I wanted to point out some of the specifics about the regions and the communities that I'll be talking about today. Um, and then I'll, I'll showcase um, an example of, from our, the Kanazivik um, work that we're doing. And I'll be focusing on a particular community that's um, conducting the, the, the work and that's research and service. Uh, I'll talk about the indigenous, the Yupik indigenous model that guides um, what is a community driven and culturally grounded uh, service delivery uh, implementation. Then I'll um, finish up with talking about the legacy of the research and, you know, how we've been able to understand um, youth outcomes and and get to those youth outcomes um, in in terms of building reasons for life sobriety and protective factors as our primary um, outcomes for this and and at this point um, we're far enough along in our research where we have gathered an evidence base we've uh, and, and we've demonstrated feasibility of this uh prevention approach yeah. as well as efficacy and i'll go over the data that we have and where we are to date in terms of our um final prevention trial that we're running right now so first of course i must acknowledge well first i'd like to acknowledge the land upon which today i am sitting which is of the people of Trothiada, um, our Athabascan communities here in the interior of alaska and i also need to acknowledge the elders that have I, that I've learned from, who have mentored me, um, who have guided all of the work um, and still do guide all of the work today. Um, I'll point out that the gentleman on the left is Dr. Uh, Jerry Mohat, and he's the reason I'm here in Alaska. <laughs> he came and gave a talk down at Northwest Indian College when I was teaching there. I got my master's at Western Washington University. Um, and, he told, and he gave a talk about this amazing new project, which I'll touch on called the People Awakening Project. And it really captured me as here's someone from a university coming to a reservation, a native reservation, and, and talking about what's going right <laughs> in Alaska Native communities in this case, but really wanting to explore um, pathways that lead to sobriety because those pathways are there, they exist, they're strong. And so I was captivated by him. These two other elders are from the community of Alaganak, uh, which I'll be touching on as well. Uh, and again, that was our foundational community that really, really taught us um, about what, what is going to um, strengthen young people, what's going to protect them, what's going to end the scourge of suicide and, um, and self-harm that was happening. So I always like to start with first providing a context for Alaska that's based on, on the inherent strengths of Alaska Native and all Indigenous people that resides in the ancestors that went through great, you know, great challenge, great obstacle, even before um, colonization, which you know, again, we'll talk about that health, how that impacted health transitions here in Alaska. But even before that, ancestors were facing, you know, famines and 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 weather events and and all of these things. But you know, we're here today as Indigenous people, and you know, we have to always keep that focus on what, you know, what our ancestors have fought for, so that we're here today. Um, and the inherent, again, the inherent strengths within indigenous cultures and languages and how that creates protective experiences for children that absolutely can build resilience against adversity. Um, and that everyone working together is needed for survival. And so a community approach to prevention and intervention um, is essential, um, but often overlooked, particularly when we're, when we're tending to rely on more Western based modalities of mental health and substance um, use treatment care, where it's, you know, more clinical. Um, so I'll talk a little, well, I'll talk a lot about the community driven approach that guides uh, this work. Uh, and then also saying that, well, not, yes, alcohol was rare after it was introduced um, when whalers would come through and, you know, when the Russians came into the, the, territories and all of that, but it was absolutely not a part of indigenous cultures in Alaska. 
Um, and suicide among young people was absolutely unheard of in the memories of today's elders. And that's that's mentioned a lot in terms of, okay, you know, to, we've seen transitions today. So what can we, you know, how can we draw on what kept us so strong and protected and healthy in, in, um, in our ancestors' lives? So for those, again, <laughs> Alaska is very large <laughs> geographically, spanning about one third of the size of the um, continental United States. Extremely, very diverse culturally, linguistically, um, ways of life differ. So this is our, um, comes from our uh, Alaska Native Language Center map showing the big differences in our state. And so, you know, I, I reside here among the peoples of the Tanana. Um, and what I'll be talking about is the Central Yupik uh, region in Southwest Alaska. And just to provide again, geography, um, it, it actually takes me, I mean, it takes me nearly twice as long. It takes me about 17 hours and four different flights for me to go from Fairbanks down to Anchorage to Bethel. We usually have to stop up in St. Mary's and then back down to get to the communities um, where I can hop on a flight and three and a half hours get to Seattle and an hour and a half, well, if I'm speeding, drive up to Bellingham. So, you know, it, it actually is it's closer for me in some ways to work um, in Western Washington still. I guess I could have said. So again, um, the region, this is highlighting the region I'll be talking about. The red dots here mark the communities that are currently a part of our um, prevention trial and are implementing um, the Knazivik intervention. There's 58 uh, villages in the service region. This region is about the size of the state of Nebraska. So there's no roads in into or between any of these um, communities. So you know, plane travel um, is essential. And I'll have to say that COVID-19 has certainly created a, many additional challenges in providing care. One of our largest um, Bush Airlines Raven Air shut down as bankrupt. And so flights have dramatically decreased. Um, and so there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on right now. Um, uh, Again, Alaska uh, has, has uh, developed the community health aid practitioner and behavioral health aid models, uh, mostly out of necessity because it's impossible to staff every, every village, every one of the 256 um, federally recognized tribes and villages in our state with um, medical providers and mental health providers. So again, community driven and community uh, level solutions are critical. Uh, most villages in this region ban the importation and sale of alcohol and are dry, considered dry under the Alaska Local Option Law, although this law has not proven effective in many studies in terms of reducing um, or impacting our disparities. And as I've mentioned, there's been significant um, health transitions that began um, research tells us began in, in the late 1950s, really took off in the early 1960s, which coincides with the um, the real like the real push on getting Alaskan Native people, particularly in the Yupik this Yupik region, to settle into villages and not move to seasonal camps and settle around school. And the, this is when schools were established in villages, um, which was a good thing, believe me, because before that, every everyone was sent out uh, um, to boarding schools. So in the 1960s and 70s, we see a real transition um, in suicide, particularly when suicide with young people. Um, alcohol also becomes a lot more prevalent in the region. Um, and what we see today is outcomes of these transitions um, and some very serious disparities. This is just showing um, alcohol abuse mortality. Um, so deaths that are related to alcohol um, and poisoning and um, ooh and health conditions that are alcohol, like cirrhosis. Um, and then this is just showing the, uh, this is, these are the major road system arteries in Alaska. Yes, there's many more roads. These are not the only roads we have, but these are showing our major arteries just to, also, to juxtaposition that on top of, this is uh, um, 
an epidemiology map showing rates of suicide by region. And as you can see, our three highest regions in Alaska that have rates on average of 61 to 66 per 100,000. And that's with, you know, US rates um, are at 13 per 100,000. Alaska has higher rates just in general. So we're around um, 20 per 100,000. But these, uh, these areas in particular, um, are most remote in Alaska, most difficult to access. Um, and the Yupik region, in particular the yukon kuskokwim region, has the highest population um, of people living in rural communities. So suicide in Alaska is absolutely a public health crisis. Um, and it's particularly uh, impacting young people. So young people between the ages of 15 and 29 um, have much higher rates and um, and die by suicide um, at higher rates. And young Alaska Native men in particular um, are impacted with rates um, per capita of 155 uh, per 100,000. And it's just unacceptable. <laughs> the burden is unacceptable. Solutions are critical um, and must come from the people. So as I mentioned, in the late, well, in the 1960s through the, the late 1970s, we just saw a J curve of, of deaths um, of Alaska Native people by you know, causes related to um, alcohol abuse and suicide risk. And there was a series, a Pulitzer uh, Prize winning series, A People in Peril that was published in the Anchorage Daily News. And it was published in 1988, but it ran through 19, almost a year. And in that series of articles, one after the other, after the other, after the other, and I mentioned those elders in Alakanak, um, after another. I mean, if you just read these, these, this, is, this was what was being put out to our state, our people, collectively about the crisis. And it was, you know, absolutely true but also once you get down to a curse upon the unborn and the final article is a revolution of hope you you don't feel that hopeful um, when once again over and over again the story that's being told is one of absolute trauma hardship and pain and that is that exists absolutely but in Alaska Native communities in the hearts of the people, the minds of the people, the families, there's, there is hope, there's strength, there's love, passion, and, and that wasn't lost, that was not lost, um, might have, as the, so the, and the elders will say, we might have, it might have gone to sleep, um, you know, our, our, our language, our, um, you know, all of those extraordinarily important guiding values in our cultures, you know, they're there. Um, we just need to awaken to them um, in the full way that, that we have been and still are. Um, and so the People Awakening Project was, actually came from um, a call to action by the Alaska Federation of Natives following the People in Peril 1991, the Alaska Federation of Natives put out a call for research. Research that, that will examine um, the strengths, but also examine how Alaska, the Alaska Native people and communities that are, are doing well, um, living strong and sober lives, those who have maybe struggled with alcohol or other substance use disorders, but who have um, regained their wellness and their own self-definitions. And so the People Awakening Project did just that. And it, it's actually, I, I came to the University of Alaska Fairbanks to do my PhD with Dr. Jerry Mohat and work on this project. So I had the privilege and fortune to be able to work on the People Awakening Project where we did um, over 100 life history interviews with Alaska Native people all over the state who had either never had a problem with alcohol, um, so a lifetime of wellness around from alcohol, or those who had at one point um, had a problem with alcohol, but had a secure um, wellness and recovery from it. And in those projects in the 
um, other slide had listed um, references where we've published from those from this project in um, areas of, of what was preventative and what contributed to recovery. And actually a lot of those factors were the same and they were embedded within culture and community um, that kept people well and strong and contributed to um, resilience, never having um, walked that road uh, with alcohol. And, and again, and actually this isn't said enough that Alaska Native and American Indian people have the highest rates of lifetime sobriety. Um, and so, you know, we really learned from that. We learned what characteristics and what factors were contributing to, to those strengths and also contributing to recovery. And again, they were often the same, but for those in, in a recovery process, these factors just came later in life. Connection to identity and who you are, connection to the elders and relearning language and um, yeah. Uh, anyway, so this is one of our um, <laughs> this is one of our early <laughs> uh, graphic representations. You'll see how we we kind of take we try and represent models um, that typically ha are represented in science <laughs> a bit differently. We try and use more ecological um, references uh, that resonate with the people in terms of describing a process, a, a change. Um, and so essentially, and we'll be able to go over our long history of projects from the People Awakening Project to now um, what's led to a service implementation through several, we have several Native Connections Tribal Behavior Health Grants from SAMHSA that fund the interventions um, in the communities. So that's that's been wonderful to be able to have that support. We've also had support from our state of Alaska has supported this project as well as from the regional tribal health organizations. But as you can see, it's been it's been many years. Um, uh, a lot of work has gone into to establishing this model. And so um, highly encourage checking out the Konezovic, uh digital. We have a digital online. We call it a manual, but you know, again, it, it's um, it's really just a collection of stories that, you know, in, can illuminate and instruct on how um, the, how the, these Yupik communities are listed here came together um, to cast out that spirit of suicide and to protect young people um, from dangers and risks in their community like alcohol. Um, and so I acknowledge all of the communities who are part of this and the people who are part of this. Dr. James Allen at the University of Minnesota Medical School, um, formerly of Canner, and was another one of my mentors. He's absolutely foundational and fundamental to all this work. So I just want to acknowledge him and encourage checking out the manual that includes um, videos and you know, a lot of instruction about the kinds of activities that are conducted um, and the process of coming together as a community first, uh, identifying uh, activities for young people, delivering those activities, and then coming back together as a community continually to both evaluate this, this process, to understand it more, figure out what's working best, um, and just to continue that, that process of you know, collect, collectively addressing this issue, um, because it you know again, cult, healing needs to come and must come from within. We know that I mean, it must come from within ourselves as individuals, but must also come from within our families and our communities. So I'm going to now um, showcase a community. This is going to be Scammon Bay. I should have pointed it out on the map but again, coast of the Bering Sea. And um, Georgiana Ningluk is the is kind of the lead, but she does this in very close work with uh, the elders and other members of the community. Um, and I think, do I just, okay. So I'm just going to talk through, this is a short video, it's just four minutes. And, but it will take you through, um, take you literally out on the land where the majority of the instruction and delivery of the prevention activities or modules as they're called takes place and so young people are engaged in their traditional cultural activities that as you will see here 
deeply and thoroughly revolve around subsistence. So uh, actually the majority of, of Yupik diets are still coming from the land um, and, and are very healthy, but food transitions have been um, linked to uh, the negative health transitions that we've seen. Um, when people, again, stores were established and we have flights coming in with pallets of pop and candy and oops, I touched something, I think. It's kind of looking funny to me. So, and that's seal flipper. So when, you know, when diets changed and bodies changed, you know, minds changed with it and getting young people back to living their very active and healthy way of life, getting off their phones, uh, getting off, you know, getting out of, of the house, um, eating the very healthy omega-3 rich foods. Um, that's all very important. Also key though, it's not, it, it's not just the activity, it's the instruction that comes with the activity and the connection that's being made by elders who attend activities with young people. We always have instructors. You'll see that with the adults that go out with the young people and they will tell stories to young people. Um, I always think about, so I don't think it's in this slideshow, but um, there are teachings that connect young people in really real ways, in relational ways to the animals um, and to, again, the spirit of this world. And the spirituality piece and building up of young people's understanding of themselves um, in a spiritual way is also a fundamental protective factor um, in this work and actually something that we've, you know, that, that's been trickiest for us to develop a way of um, being able to measure growth in spiritual protective factors, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing that, but that making that spiritual connection for young people is part of uh, prevention for alcohol um, misuse and suicide is, is fundamental and, and considered by our Yupik elders to be among the most protective of our protective factors. And so young people are, are, are you know, immersed in, in this activity that, again, they're beginning to, you know, more powerfully understand as being a spiritual activity um, and really gaining their identity as who they are as, as Yupik people. Um, and this is wood gathering and everything, again, everything that, that is gathered and processed as part of these activities is then distributed back in the, the community. Um, it's, it's always uh, one of our actually greatest <laughs> um, points of impact is when young people are contributing and seeing their value and their purpose as part of their community, they're contributing to their their family, they're giving to their grandparents, and that's been really important and, and it's huge because of the transitions that have kind of removed young people from their purpose um, and their value and their their absolute essential <laughs> essential um, role as part of the family. And this so this effort, um, oops. So this effort builds, builds that back into young people. And that's exactly the, the purpose of the activities. Um, and these are just, uh, these are photos from just last week and a couple weeks before. So right now it's beluga season and halibut, it was tail end of halibut. It's time to gather wood before freeze up, moose hunting season. Um, this young man in the middle there, that was his, getting his first seal. And that's a very important spiritual time and rite of passage for a young person, a first seal. Um, and he gave that seal a drink of water to have it have a safe journey home and distributed the seal meat throughout the community. And there was a very socially distanced <laughs> celebration for him. Um, and so now I, I'll just take us through um, really the implementation model. This is a, in the indigenous theory of change that, that guides 
this work. So I wanted to first show you all these amazing activities that are happening right now that communities are doing and actually can still do even at a time of COVID. I mean, this was one of the really beautiful, um, beautiful things that, that we've witnessed here in Alaska is that, you know, yes, it's, it's actually quite <laughs> scary, you know, in thinking about how the plane stopped flying and all of a sudden, you know, the remoteness was even more acute. But what happened, what we witnessed um, was communities who were doing our, this Knozovic work just really accelerated it. Um, of course, after, particularly after communities had started to lift it, lift up the um, community health mandates. Uh, and really, so co communities here have been uh, really exercising their self-determination, self-governance, and communities have absolutely shut down. <laughs> and so in many ways have been able to still be together in ways that other communities, like we, it's not possible on some of our like reservation communities that have been so heavily impacted. And so uh, communities have, have kind of pivoted into um, increasing the amount of subsistence activities, particularly since food, <laughs> the planes bringing in food from outside were cut down. And so there were, there were incentives that went out to communities for fuel and gas. And so we really saw this just amazing, um, just bloom of activity and focus around getting people out in the land and increasing that work. So, um, and we've been able to attract that, but, the work really revolves around the re-centering of Yupik communities uh, towards their indigenous practices and the and also the, the structures and systems that were in place in Yupik communities. And Yupik communities were centered around the Kazakh. So yes, these were still, these were mobile communities, but all winter long, actually, um, there would be settlements and the large structure in the middle is called the Kazakh. And it's the men's house. And traditionally men and boys about age eight or nine years old would live in the Kazakh and you know, make tools and work on things and um, take steam baths. And the houses around the Kazakh would be inhabited by women and smaller children, but they were connected by underground tunnels and they would have many celebrations all winter long um, and with song and dance. And, you know, the Kazakh was really considered, it, it's in the Yupik language, it's, it's a noun, but it's also a verb. If you put, because because I, mm, <laughs> I have only baby you pick, um, but also means encircling and coming around. And the kazik uh, is talked about as where people, and not just men, but where the community would gather, um, and and yes, have joyous celebration, but also would you know if there were problems in the community, if there was shortages of food, if there was strange weather events and patterns happening, people would gather and in the Kazakh and and talk about it, discuss, problem solve, um, and then implement solutions. And so we'll go. And this is actually a rendering a, a rendering from. Um, uh, archival photo from Gonzaga University of from Hooper Bay in night in the 1920s um, and so as we go into the Kazakh again this well I'll just go uh, the, the interior represents the fundamentals of life there's always water and there's fire and you're on the land um, and, and then the symbology of, of the spiritualness of what's in here also being having a kayak is so um, critical to uh, particularly a men's, de men's development. When you got a kayak, that means you could get it. It's time for wife. So again, all these critically important um, factors in, in a Yupik um, coming of age and understanding of who you are. So the Kazakh model um, first begins. So this is, this describes, and I guess this is our logic model, SAMHSA grants and other grants really <laughs> like you to have logic models. And so this is, this is an indigenous logic model that represents a Yupik process of, of change and getting to outcomes that were chosen by the community. And these are strengths-based outcomes. Um, and, you know, the, the process begins and this, this, the intervention usually runs intensively over a three, we're doing it over a five-year period, but we've been studying it over an intensive delivery over a three-year period with 12 to 18-year-olds. But the whole first, I don't know, maybe six, 
nine months is the community coming together uh, and in the Qazakh. And, you know, right now there aren't structures, <laughs> traditional Qazakh structures anymore in communities, um, but the process continues and there are, you know, most communities will have a school with a large cafeteria space or we'll have a community hall um, where people can gather. And, you know, and Billy Charles, who is really our leader of this, um, of speaking about this part of the work, will talk about how, you know, communities when they came and were settled and throughout the, really the 70s, in the 60s, 70s and 80s were fragmented um, when you know, traditional structures and governance and leadership was kind of parceled out into these imposed um, processes like being a part of a city government or even a tribe. I thought, you know, the, the way that the IRA sets up uh, tribal governance structures was is actually not um, it's kind of it's foreign to Yupik cultures um, and so again communities were fragmented where you know this you know the, the green here represents you know how community understood each other <laughs> um, and then these these kind of institutions came in and people started seeing themselves a part of these institutions you're with tribe you're with the city and in some communities um, different factions, even though the uh, the Yupik region was uh, given to the Jes Jesuits, and so they're mostly it's Catholic, but some communities, and then Moravians were in another section, but um, other denominations have come in, and there's been some factionalization around um, around that, and so, and again, and then there's there's also other, you know, structures at the regional level with uh, health corporations and us. And so the Kazakh just recenters everyone together. And, um, and it's not about being a part of any one of these organizations anymore. It's about being part of a Kazakh in a community to work together for, for the lives and health and well-being of the young people. And so again, through and when you come together, when the community comes together, um, what what happens is we start identifying what was protective and what was healthy, what was healing in Yupik culture. And then, as you saw, you've seen all those activities, and activities are identified. And as you can see, they're often seasonal. So when it's time to go berry picking, you go berry picking. When it's time to get whale, you know, you go out and you check around because you're not ever supposed to say the name of the animal you're going to get because they'll hear you. And then, you know, finally, you know, the community. Really, and, and also when you're in the Kazakh, you're identifying, you know, what, what, what do you want to see for your young people? And of course, you want to see, you know, you want to see suicide gone. You want to see, you know, you want to see young people not drinking. Um, but early on, elders in Alakhanak in particular really flipped this around and said, listen, we don't just want our young people to not want to die. We want them... <laughs> to want to live and, and be you big. We want them to want to have a clear mind and not, not you know, we, we want them to, to have reasons for that, to have a clear mind and to be sober. So um, a real, it was really a change of the narrative uh, from suicide, from, again, trying to, you know, stop something to try and inspire something. Um, and so and now as we pull back out of the Kazakh, you know, we show um, this model. And there's a video about the, the, oops, the Kazakh model on the online um, digital Kanazovic that I encourage everyone to see because Billy does this way better than I can ever um, talk about this Yupik uh, indigenous theory of change. But what Billy always likes us to end with is that um, communities today, you know, might look different. We might have different structures, but we can implement traditional systems and that this isn't just Yupik. This every community has a Kazakh, has a concept of coming together, working together on healing and change and utilizing all of your experts and resources um, to come together and, and do that for the young people. So I'm just going to quickly, I'm going to take like maybe five minutes and then I'm probably going to be done. And I'll just go over um, some of our outcomes from our research and um, 
Typically, Jim Allen, who I referenced earlier, does this. Otherwise, I, <laughs> I definitely would have had him on, on this list because um, as you'll see, a lot of this work is he's led, he is led. Um, and so, but I, we acknowledge we have amazing um, support uh, persons who are just absolute, like absolutely able to work with communities to understand that translation. Uh, and connection between Western science approaches and indigenous science. And that's been really, um, I think one of our most amazing <laughs> learning processes is as, you know, so I, and myself, you know, I'm, I'm was trained in certain approaches from Western science and doing surveys and, um, and really our communities have guided us uh, towards, you know, again, systems within local contexts that were absolutely embedded in measuring and evaluating um, communities and people and processes. So we've tried to customize and tailor our, our again, our Western science to the indigenous science. Um, and what, so how we do that is we, we track delivery of protective factors. So we use, essentially we, we use a dose response model. So we're collecting every single activity, we're collecting um, attendance of young people. So what we do is we go in and we do baselines and we have over 700 young people that we've been tracking for about 15 years that in these five communities um, that we've done baselines with and then we'll come in every year and we'll be doing follow-up surveys. Um, and all the while, while we're doing all these activities, we're collecting attendance sheets. So we're able to match young people um, who are attending the activities and which activities to their growth and protective factors. And we'll get to that. So um, again, uh, our, our, this whole model then is looking at how um, immersion into culture and ways of life is building protection and reasons for life. Um, and so, and I'll just quickly touch on this. And as I've talked about, um, you know, there's activities like the watch the ice activity. We didn't see, since it's not winter time right now, I didn't, you didn't see many of the winter activities, but there's a lot of activity out on the land and having um, a tool to gauge uh, uh, thickness and quality of ice is essential to survival. And again, a lot of these activities, I guess we didn't do winter ones, but even summer ones, making the connection between survival skills and surviving, yes, the land, the weather, but surviving your feelings, <laughs> surviving, you know, disruptions in family, um, those are all embedded within this model of prevention. And so when young people make this ayarak, this stick, this walking stick for ice, then, then they're also instructed on how there are ugly and rotten <laughs> ice in your own community and you always have to be on the lookout for those places like brew houses and, and to you know be able to gauge and just essentially stay away from those places of danger and risk and so again we make connections between survival skills um, that will keep you protected on the land and those that will keep you protected in life um, and it's been a process of needing to develop measures because they're, you know, when we first started all this um, and you big elders were saying we need to build, you know, we need to build these factors, these protective factors in young people. Uh, you know, there were no existing ways to measure UPIC protective factors, although the People Awakening Project is what we leveraged and built upon. We've done all those interviews and actually we had developed some, some measures already that were specific around alcohol. Um, and protection against alcohol abuse and misuse. Um, but we really had to develop our ways to measure the outcomes and impacts for young people. And so have, and as you see, we've published on that and you can read it. Um, and again, once, once the measures were developed, um, we then developed a way to be able to um, have young people take these surveys. So we have this cool now, this survey app um, that we can just send a link to and then you can go on your smartphone or computer and we usually just go and have young people go into the computer labs at schools but we can't do that anymore um, and we actually have found it's that young people really like to take the survey so they move fish along the slider and as you can see um, you know questions like you know, how important um, is this to you and 
living your life, the question my Yupik elders taught me that my life is valuable. And so again, that's all goes into our reasons for life that we've developed. Because like I said, you know, we, we actually um, ethically, uh, well, it wasn't really well, yeah, but we ethically chose not to utilize um, like the Columbia suicide, like the, the suicide scales um, and the human, like the, there's a research oversight and governance um, group as part of the Yukon Custom Health uh, Corporation. But early on, we've, so we've had many discussions about it, but um, we decided not to do anything that could essentially screen for suicide um, ideation and, and instead like, develop these protective factors measures. Um, and I shouldn't get too in the weeds on that, but we could maybe <laughs> talk more about that. But um, because we, we, yeah, anyway, I almost got myself off track there. So let's just go back to, so a couple of things I want to point out before I do want to leave time for a question or two. So, um, so here's some, this is data from um, our feasibility and efficacy work. And what we've been able to find in, from our feasibility work is, is that we can absolutely show associations between protective factors, particularly com fa community protective factors, um, and reasons for life and individual youth. Absolutely. Um, and we really um, importantly have been able to show that building protection, particularly building protection against suicide risk, um, means that you are simultaneously at the same time building protection against um, alcohol misuse, reflective processes. We have measures that look at the way young people are thinking about alcohol um, and alcohol risk. And we have we do measure for um, initiation and use of alcohol. And we've been able to show the building protection that these are co-occurring. Um, suicide risk and alcohol uh, misuse risk are co-occurring. And so that again, if you're doing suicide prevention, you are doing prevention for um, alcohol misuse. So again, I've already mentioned the dose, um, what we do with dose. And so what we've essentially been able to find is that young people, the more sessions, the more activities they attend, um, the higher their, their growth of change and protection is and reasons for life. Um, and finally, actually, this is just data I'm going to skip. This is data from our most current um, effectiveness study. And again, what's really been um, what's really been coming to our attention is is how connected um, again suicide prevention is with substance abuse prevention and I, I think sometimes we tend to separate those out in fact I know we do because I see funding mechanisms all the time that will say this is for suicide prevention and, and this one's for substance abuse um, and we really need to be looking at them in, cer in certain contexts together um, so we have, and you know, a summary of our current research, it's out there. <laughs> we have many, many publications that summarize uh, where we are, but essentially, again, we have, this is, this is the first, and we, we were actually on the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices for like three months before it was shut down by SAMHSA. I'm still not pleased with that. Um, no where any of that's going, but uh, so we have evidence. Um, showing it's feasible, uh, demonstrating uh, efficacy, and showing that we have our strongest impacts are with young Alaska Native men. And that's super rare in interventions to have the kind of first participation that we do by young, by young men, um, but also that our impacts uh, with young men are highest. But that's also partly due to the fact that young men come in with lower pre-existing protection is something else that we've found. So in that dose response model, um, again, they, they tend to have stronger outcomes and have higher growth in protection because of that. So this is our team, <laughs> our wonderful team, the gentleman and the James Allen is a gentleman and this turtleneck and this is Billy Charles and all of our wonderful people and Georgiana. So, um, we have a chuck nook to all the elders, all the community members, everyone who are uh, dedicating their lives to the lives of their children, their grandchildren, great grandchildren, and the future of Indigenous peoples. And it's a bright future. It's a strong future. I'm done.
Okay, you're great. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. <laughs> we, really, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. And I, I really like the imagery that you used in your photos. It really tells a, a story. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read through some of the questions that we've received in the, in the chat box here. Um, how can technology such as a cell phone be used as a source of support for teens, especially during a pandemic? And um, the second part of that question is, and are the elders open to this idea or have you seen some resistance with that? <laughs> Oh, that'll spark a debate in any Kazakh I've ever been in about smartphones. Um, but usually while we're talking about this, an elder's phone will start going off <laughs> like in a crazy way and they'll start talking on the phone like, yes. Yeah. So no, yes, there's there's discussion around this. I think in general, as, as I mentioned, um, we utilize the fact that in this region in particular, yes, young people, most, you know, most all young people have smartphones and um, internet services pretty good um, and strong that's as opposed to other areas of Alaska so we um, will send young people like I said a link and to the survey app um, also the um, the digital Knozovic has tools that we push to um, young people through um, through the Knozovic survey app as well so we're actually kind of we're, we are utilizing that um, although so our conversation around this usually comes in that, um, yeah, elders will and other community members will have some resistance and say, okay, there are good things about this technology. Um, it does keep us connected. In fact, one thing that we found, we did a COVID survey recently and we found that 90% um, of the people reported that they get their information about COVID-19. Um, and community health mandates from Facebook, their, their community's Facebook Facebook page. And so um, it used to be like the VHF and other modalities. But within this work, I'll just say that, um, you know, we, there's a value also in just having, putting yourself on a way. And so, you know, subsistence activities, when you go outside the village, you, you lose cell reception anyway. Um, so yeah, I don't know what too much more to say about it is being utilized. I think it could be better and still, I think it could be better utilized, but it also needs to be done in moderation, everything in moderation. Great. I think you uh, touched okay. on this a little bit, but could you talk a little bit more about um, the measurement tools in this, in this study? So I, well, I can't go back to that slide. So yeah, I, there was, there was the one slide and I, I, and I'm totally, I hope you do make the slides available. Um, we will, yeah, for sure. Information on those slides, but yeah, so going back, um, we published a lot, essentially, again, the measures were developed with, with communities. We have um, community, kind of like community advisory boards with Sakazik in every single community. And so items where, well, we drew from some pre-existing measures. There's a reasons for living uh, measure, but it's been, but then we pretty much completely adapted it to work in a UPIC context. So, and we looked at, we, we drew from the family environment scale. We drew from some pre-existing scales um, and we drew, for reflective processes, we drew from the, oh, I can't remember the alcohol scale that we drew from, but they've all been adapted through a community process um, and through our research, so. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to try to summarize this one. As a person in recovery, some believe this disease is passed through uh, generations, maybe even five generations back. Uh, do a lot of these suicides with young people come from generational alcohol use? Certainly there has been a very, it's been absolutely established that the increase in alcohol availability in communities, again, beginning in the early 1960s, um, and really accelerating through there is 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 absolutely linked with the rise in suicide um, of all of all Alaskan people, um, and it's actually it's it's very linked to um, suicide are higher in general suicide rates in in Alaska and and certainly in communities in Yupik communities um, it is alcohol and suicide are talked about as intergenerationally. Um, linked 
of, of course. But again, you know, while I, I guess that's why the emphasis in this approach was to look back at those inter, inter, intergenerational and historical resilience factors and strengths that, again, before this you know, huge rise in availability of alcohol. And now, you know, there's in other communities influx of, of um, heroin and other substances um, has become super problematic and linked with suicide. Um, but again, looking back at what was protective uh, and trying to build that is, is the focus, so. Thank you. I'm gonna to try to summarize this one as well. Uh, is the Kungasvik um, model adaptive to American Indian communities according to their tribal history elders and ways of living, including food, song, crafts? And the, the second part of that is, have the surveys, assessments, um, and screening tools been evaluated? So on the second one, yes. So they're all valid. They've all been validated. And actually that was, if you remember the slide where there was a 20 plus year history of all those grants that were listed. So four of those grants were specifically for developing the measures and then validating them. Um, and so evaluating and validating them. So they are scientifically valid measures of protection, of awareness of connectedness, of reasons for life, of reflective processes about alcohol, of communal mastery, of um, trying to remember all my measures, but yes, so that one's a yes. Now, in terms of Knozovic's adaptability, so this is where it goes back to every community has a Kazakh. So while we we have not we have not studied or or even attempted uh, adaptation um, of of this into another, into an like American Indian community context. But something that has happened um, or that we are, that I am actively doing is essentially with, um, with my projects at the Northwest Indian College, which are also NIH funded, um, we have started a process um, that's aligned with the People Awakening process is called Native Transformations. And this is, and we published our first paper where essentially we went, we did a whole, we did a bunch of life history interviews looking at um, protective factors uh, about around drug and alcohol use in Coast Salish communities. And so, and we identified um, again, culturally specific Coast Salish strengths and protective factors and reasons for life and, and recovery factors. And so we're now, and we're taking our second step and we're you know building towards an intervention that would essentially be an adaptation of Konozovic. So um, we, we, we definitely hypothesize that yes, this, is, this could be adaptable, um, just you know, needing to focus on um, you know, the function of building protection rather than its specific form. Great, I think we might have time for one more um, and then we'll do a, a quick wrap up. Uh, the research focuses on 12 to 18 year old youth. How are younger children or young adults at high risk engaged? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Yes, um, the research focuses on 12 to 18 year old youth. How are younger children or young adults at high risk engaged? Um, that's a, that's a great, that's a familiar question. <laughs> so yes, I, you, typically, um, this comes up in that the research has focused on, um, collecting, you know, doing the surveys with 12 to 18 year olds. And so that question about measurement validation, um, also has a component of these measures are validated with, um, that developmental group in particular, so they're not validated for younger than 12, um, but we would actually probably be able to argue that older, like the older youth or young adults would certainly be able to take them. But um, the, the intervention itself is a universal intervention and young people do attend activities. Um, children younger than 12 will attend with parents or aunties or uncles or grandparents. And then older youth, the 18 to 24, the um, the group considered really at highest highest risk, we involve as 
um, instructors, essentially. We involve them as, as mentors. They'll drive the boats. Um, they'll throw the anchors. They'll, um, you know, haul. <laughs> haul the heavy, the bigger seals and things like that. And so it, we do involve younger and older youth um, in that, but we, we look at outcomes with the 12 to 18 year old groups because that's what the community actually, that's the age group they identified um, as really wanting to get to um, before, yeah, just, I guess I'll just leave it there. Great. Thank you, Stacey. I really appreciate okay. your, your time today. Um, please fill out our, our survey. You'll be getting a, an email with the link to that today, and it's also posted up in the chat box. Um, and uh, you can check out our website for future webinars. Um, right now, they're to be determined. But um, thank you, Stacey. We Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today and thank you Meg for um, doing the controls for our Zoom session here on the background and our participants. Uh, we hope to see you next time. Hope you have a good day. Thank you.